Well, if you're not there already, uh, please turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. We're going to be starting in verse 1. And the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon a land, and the people of the land take one man from among them, and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land, and blows on the trumpet, and warns the people, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet, and does not take warning, and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken warning, he would have escaped with his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming, and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and a sword comes and takes a person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Now as for you, son of man, I have given you as a watchman for the house of Israel, so you will hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from your hand. But as for you, if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. Now as for you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have spoken, saying, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we are rotting away in them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares Lord Yahweh. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turns from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? Let's pray. Father, you know that I've been sorely convicted this week as I've prepared And Lord, I frankly feel unqualified to speak on this subject. But Lord, I pray that you would use me, God. That this would not be me, Lord. If if I do this out of my own strength, Lord, I will fail. But God, if you will pour out your spirit and move today, Lord, we will see... We will see much change in the world around us, I'm confident. Father, if we do anything out of the flesh, it's worthless. And so, Lord, I pray that you would put in in your people a hunger and a thirst, Lord, first for you, and second, to proclaim your word to a dying people. Father, this is not about me this morning. And I pray, Lord, that tomorrow I would be forgotten, but your word would be held in high esteem, Lord, imprinted upon the hearts and the minds of your people so that they may obey you. So, Lord, would you have your way among us? Use me, Lord. You could use sticks and stones if you wanted to. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'm going to give you some context uh, before we really dig into the passage. So Ezekiel, uh, he lived in an extremely tumultuous time. The people that God had chosen to bring about his redemptive purpose among the nations had chosen to rebel against him again and again. And because of their sins, God had already brought judgment against the northern kingdom of Israel, as they were conquered by the Assyrians. And now a century later, uh, the southern kingdom, Judah, quickly followed pace. So the rejection of God and his commandments were storing up his wrath. 
and he would carry out the curse that he promised his people when they settled in the promised land to bring pestilence, destruction, and exile if they didn't abide by his law. Ezekiel lived under the reign of King Josiah, and he experienced a short-lived spiritual revival in the kingdom. But after his death, under the kings that followed, the nation plunged back into sin. And at this time, the Babylonian Empire ruled the world, the empire that God would use to bring judgment against Judah. They defeated the world powers of Assyria and Egypt, and then they went after the lesser kingdoms, such as Judah. So Judah's defeat and destruction at the hands of Babylon came in three stages. There was the first deportation. The Babylonians besieged Jerusalem and deported a large group of captives, including the prophet Daniel, to Babylon. The second, uh, the second deportation, they again besieged Jerusalem, and they defeated the city and deported 10,000 more captives. And then there was the third deportation. A decade later, the Babylonians invaded a third time and utterly destroyed Jerusalem. And the last group of survivors was deported to Babylon. Now, Ezekiel was shipped to Babylon uh, during the second deportation where he witnessed the work of false prophets who promised that they would return to Jerusalem, that God would not bring a final destruction. God called Ezekiel to prophetic ministry five years after he was exiled to be the watchman of the house of Israel. And his first series of prophecies confronted these false hopes of the exiles, pronouncing that Jerusalem would in fact be destroyed. Then after this, he turned his focus to the Gentile nations, promising retribution against them. And now in this passage, uh, it marks the second half of the book of Ezekiel as he turns his attention back to the sons of Israel in the wake of Jerusalem's final destruction. Ezekiel's call to be a watchman, which he received from God privately at the beginning of his ministry, is now reiterated publicly. Although Jerusalem is about to fall, Ezekiel will proclaim a message of hope throughout the second half of the book. Though the false hopes of the people have been dashed and God's judgment has been made evident, the people can still find life if they will repent of their sins and turn toward God. So God, in this charge to Ezekiel that we just read, places a responsibility both on him and his hearers. Just as was made clear in his earlier commission, Ezekiel was to carry out his duty as Israel's watchman faithfully. And as he announces his role as the watchman publicly, the responsibility to hear and take heed of his warning is placed upon the people. And so we see in this passage, the watchman is called to be steadfast and watching for danger, swift in warning the people, and satisfied in fulfilling his duty. Now, let's go back to verse 2. The watchman is called. Son of man, Speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon a land, and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman. So we see here in this metaphor that God is using, a watchman was chosen by his people. He would have been a person with remarkable eyesight, skilled with the shofar, the trumpet of ram's horn, and he would have had a reputation of reliability. A watchman in this time of of war and conquest, would have been placed on the highest lookout post in town, either on the roof of the city gate or a tower specifically designed to be the watchman's post. His duty was one that was likely menial and boring at times. He would have been forgotten or unseen. But if an enemy of the city were to approach, this watchman would have been the most valuable man in the city. A man who the people probably did not hear from very much would have had a breath that was more valuable than any riches. As he would give a blast on his shofar, calling for the people to take shelter behind the city walls, for the gates to be slammed shut, and for the warriors to take defensive positions. A special trust and confidence were placed in him by those who set him, called him, to be their watchman that he would faithfully watch and warn. They placed, 
they ventured their lives upon his fidelity. In verse 7, we see that Ezekiel is a watchman called by God. Now as for you, son of man, I have given you as a watchman for the house of Israel, so you will hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. So the metaphor here is clear. God uses the imagery of the watchman to describe the prophet's duties. He is to warn the house of Israel of the coming judgment. And so Ezekiel, with sight of approaching danger, the judgment of God, was to sound his shofar by proclaiming a warning and pleading for repentance from the people so that they would have the opportunity to repent and live. So God places a special trust and confidence in Ezekiel as he sets him to be Israel's watchman. The lives of the people were staked on the fidelity of his task. We, in a similar manner, have been called to be watchmen, having been set apart by God, informed of the wrath that abides on unbelievers and the fiery vengeance that Messiah will inflict when he comes and judgment. We are to sound our shofarim, our trumpets, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ so that our hearers may repent and live. And we see that the watchman is called to be steadfast and watching for danger. Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, If I bring a sword upon the land, and the people of the land take one man from among them, and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land, and blows on the trumpet. Okay, so we see from the Hebrew, the word watchman is actually a verb. It's a participial verb, which mean, means it denotes continuous action. So it can literally be translated, the one who is watching. He's not distracted. He's not overcome by apathy or an uncaring attitude. He doesn't fall asleep. He doesn't change his focus. He does not neglect his watch in any way. He is one who is continuously watching. Why? He knows that the very lives of his people are dependent upon him remaining focused. He won't be caught unaware. And Jesus commands us to do the same. In Matthew 24, he says, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So he is coming. He's coming in fiery vengeance. And he commands you to be prepared, to stay awake, to stay vigilant, to stay steadfast in your watch. He continues, Who then is the faithful and prudent slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour which he does not know, and will, will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites." In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus here issues a warning. If you are not awake, if you are not keeping watch, you will be assigned a place with the hypocrites. And that's hell. And so, I don't mean to be grave right now, but Jesus gives a serious warning. If you're not keeping watch, you don't have much to be assured about when it comes to your salvation. The only way, he says, to stay alert is to tend to his business. We must be steadfast in our watch. Next we see the watchman is called to be swift 
and warning the people. And he sees, he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows on the trumpet and warns the people. Then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken the warning, he would have escaped with his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and a sword comes and takes a person from them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from the watchman's hand. Now as for you, son of man, I have given you as a watchman for the house of Israel, so that you will hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. The wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but, but his blood I will require from your hand. So at first sight of danger, the watchman is to sound the warning. The watchman and the in the physical sense, at the first sight of dust rising on the horizon, he would have blown his shofar, warning the people. And here, Yahweh, God, is saying that he himself is coming against the people. The Almighty, eternal creator of the universe is poised for attack, bringing his sword against the wicked. No wall is thick enough, no gate is strong enough, no no warrior mighty enough to stop his onslaught. Nothing will prevent him from carrying out justice. And the scriptures say that is a, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In Ezekiel 21, Yahweh says, I have given the glittering sword. Ah, it is made for striking like lightning. It is wrapped up in readiness for slaughter. Show yourself sharp. Go to the right. Set yourself, go to the left, wherever your edge is pointed. And I also will strike my hands together, and I will cause my wrath to be at rest. I, Yahweh, have spoken. So the edge of God's sword of judgment is pointed at sinners, and his wrath will only be brought to rest when they're punished. Romans 1 says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So we can say that the house of Israel is about to be judged for their sins. They were steeped in idolatry. They were adulterers. They were liars. They were blasphemers, murderers at heart. So are we. We all are. This is the natural disposition of all people. We are all sinners by birth and sinners by choice. And we're all born with God's sword of wrath poised, aimed, set at us, ready to strike. Psalm 5 says that he is not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil does not sojourn with him. The boastful shall not stand before his eyes. He hates all workers of iniquity. He destroys those who speak falsehood. And he abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. That's all of us. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 3.26 The wages of that sin is death. We deserve death at the hands of a just God. And there's nothing that you can do, that I can do, in and of ourselves to escape His wrath. Your best works on your best day only earn you hell. They're filthy rags before a holy God. Your best effort could only prompt Him to sharpen His sword. If you, if you're living in your sins today, he'll justly slay you and you'll die in your iniquity. So this might prompt you to ask, is our condition hopeless? By my efforts, yes. By your efforts, yes. 
But God himself took action. If God had not taken action, it would be hopeless. But with his sword drawn back in one hand, he has extended the other in an offer of mercy that comes only through the finished work of his son. Romans 5, 6 through 11 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, you might be someone who's never heard this stuff before, and you're asking, what does that mean? We're fallen people of a fallen creation. Our first father, Adam, sinned against God. He acted as our representative in that garden. Since then, we've all inherited his sin, and by choice we have sinned against God, breaking his commandments. We've made ourselves God rather than him. We've blasphemed his name. We've lied. We've stolen, no matter what the value of the object stolen was. We've all hated someone, and therefore we're all murderers in our hearts. I could go on. But just one point of the law broken is enough to condemn us before a holy God. We stand guilty on our own. And God, looking down upon us in mercy, having predestined His Son to come before eternity passed, sent Him at the perfect time. He lived a perfectly righteous life, not breaking God's law at any point and fulfilling every righteous requirement of it. He he shone his light among men, and men hated him for it. They sent him to a Roman cross to die, having been unfairly condemned. He was executed by the worst form of human punishment ever invented. Nails were driven into his hands and his feet. A crown of thorns pressed into his skull. Messiah was was torn to bits by the cat of nine tails to the point where he was unrecognizable. He didn't even look like a human, the scriptures say. He suffered the worst form of human punishment imaginable. They hoisted him up upon that cross and he hung there suffocating slowly, dripping blood. And it wasn't that that atoned for your sins. When he was upon that cross, God the Father, the one whose sword is aimed at you, aimed at me, looked at his Son. And upon that cross, he made him who knew no sin, to be our sin. Christ took our robe of sin, put it upon himself, and God the Father looked at him with the hatred that he looks at the sinner outside of Christ. And he took that sword that is poised at the sinner and he ran it through his son, fully satisfying his wrath on your behalf. He died. He was laid in a tomb. And on the third day, God rose his son in power from the grave. He's Lord over death. He's Lord over all. And he rose him for your justification. It was God saying, I accept the payment that he made on your behalf. And what you must do is repent of the sin that he died for and place your faith in him and his finished work and you'll be justified, seen as righteous in the eyes of God because you now wear Christ's cloak of righteousness. 1 John 2 says, "He He himself is the propitiation for our sins. He satisfied the wrath of God for us. And this full gospel 
should be the sound that rings from our trumpets. We must warn all people of their stat- status before God here and now. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. We must warn all people of what comes after death. Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. And the scriptures say, He will judge you according to your deeds. We must warn of Christ's return. John saw his return in Revelation 19 in a vision. He says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sits on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, having a name written on him which no one knows except himself. And being clothed with a garment dipped in blood, his name is also called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the wrath of God the Almighty, and he has on his garments and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul writes, The Lord Jesus will come from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, executing vengeance on those who do not know God and, those, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will pay the penalty of destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. So for those who trust in Christ, place their faith in him, the wrath of God has been fully satisfied. For those who have not and will not, the sword still looms over their head, patiently waiting to strike. Someday that hand that is extended in mercy will be pulled back and he will mount the sword with both. And he will strike with deadly precision. And the fate of the unrepentant sinner is an eternity of indescribable torment in the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth under God's undiluted wrath in a very real and very hot hell. How many people do you know that are under that very wrath right now? How many people are there among the nations that are under that wrath right now? In the state of Alabama, in Mobile, Alabama, on Sun Valley Drive, in your homes, in your schools, in your workplaces, if they don't repent and believe the gospel, this is the closest to heaven they will ever get. This life of sickness, pain, death, disappointment is the greatest paradise they will ever know. They'll gasp under his torment to return to a fallen creation. It's our responsibility to warn them before it's too late. Jesus commands us to be witnesses of the gospel. He says, go therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He tells his his disciples in Acts chapter 1, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. We must speak. No one's going to be saved by you living a good life. If, you're, if you say, I live the good Christian life, you know, but my, my faith is for me. It's reserved. I don't like to speak about it very much. You're not a witness. In this, in this text, it says we'll be held responsible for what we do not say. Verse 6, but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned, And a sword comes and takes a person from them. He is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood 
I will require from the watchman's hand. Again in verse 8. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. Now before we further address this matter, we got to ask the question, why would you not speak? Now, based on this text, it beca it's because you're not keeping a steadfast watch. If you're going to warn others, you must be alert, awake, focused on eternity. You can't do this while you're giving yourself away to trifles. Is a Thursday night football game more important than an outreach opportunity? Is the phone in your hand more important than the soul sitting across the table? While we speak about evangelism, have sermon series about evangelism, have conventions about evangelism, we speak about it with zeal. We merely polish our trumpets without putting it to our lips. If we would truly see the gravity of the wrath coming against these people, we would do more than simply pray for a burden to evangelize. Or fool ourselves into thinking we're soldiers for Christ because we post something trite on Instagram about the Bible. We have to open our eyes. There's a danger ever approaching a lost world. A second reason, you lack love. Our motive for gospel proclamation, our motive for the Great Commission is found in the Great Commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You might use fear as an excuse. But the very fact that you're afraid proves that you're without love. Perfect love casts out fear. This, for the believer, this is fear of condemnation. We don't have to fear that because of God's love. But because of this same love, we're prompted to share that news. So we must not pray for less fear. We need to pray for more love. Don't love the lost. If you truly open your eyes, keep that steadfast watch, and you see the danger that is approaching, and you don't warn them, you hate them. In your words, you can try to claim otherwise, but in your silence, you've proved to do so. You don't love God. 1 John 4.20 says, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So if you hate the lost, you hate God. How can you claim to love God and yet silently watch people die in their sins when he has commanded you to warn them? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. What was his last commandment? You will be my witnesses. But our primary concern is not for the lost. This is the most important part. Our primary concern is God's glory. If we rightly love God, we will rightly love the lost. We must have compassion for the sinner, but our zeal for God and His glory must outweigh all. We evangelize because there are lives, there are communities, there are nations that don't worship God. If you love Him, you'll want to see His name worshipped everywhere. We lovingly obey Him so that His name will be glorified. We will be held responsible for poor watch, for contempt toward God and His commandments, and the lost that die without a warning. God says, their blood I will require from your hand. This same phrase is used in, used in Genesis 4 when Cain murdered Abel. 
So the watchman has just as much blood guilt for not warning the people as Cain did for murdering his brother. If a watchman, the physical watchman, for whatever reason, did not warn his people, and a nation came and attacked and slaughtered them, he would be held responsible for their death and charged with capital murder. In the same way, God holds us responsible for what we did not say to the sinner who dies in their sin. The Hebrew actually uses an intensive verb here. It literally says, He will earnestly seek the blood from our hands. It's for this very reason that the Apostle Paul said, For if I proclaim the gospel, I have nothing to boast, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not proclaim the gospel. And if we don't proclaim the gospel, we'll say the same thing. Woe is me. Jesus says, from everyone who has been given much, much is required. And we can try to comfort ourselves and reason that this passage is from the Old Testament and it's only to be applied to this Old Testament prophet and it doesn't apply to us as New Testament believers. There are probably people sitting in here formulating a theological defense to pre present to me after service as to why I'm wrong about this, but I'm going to appeal to Paul who I trust is a, a much greater theologian than you are. In Acts 18, he preached the gospel in Corinth. But when they resisted and blasphemed, verse 6, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. In Acts 20, when he is saying farewell to the Ephesian elders in Miletus, he says, But I do not make my life of any account nor dear to myself so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord, Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. So if we ignore sin, if we flatter sinners, provide them with a false sense of peace, provide ourselves with a false sense of peace, and thinking it's okay not to warn them, we will have much to answer for. Unbelievers are punished for their own sin. The text says he will die in his iniquity. But Dr. Charles Quarles has a good quote. He says, it is our sin of silence that seals their doom. There's yet another reason why you might remain silent. A misconstrued view of the doctrine of election. You, you, you might say, okay, well, even if I don't tell them, if they're God's elect, they'll hear the gospel some way, repent, and be saved. Scripture does indeed affirm that in eternity past, God graciously elected a people for himself, predestining them for an unmerited salvation. This is a doctrine I cherish. Don't get that wrong, okay? But this doctrine is raped if it's used as an excuse for the willful sin of apathy. Election and evangelism are not mutually exclusive. God has ordained one means of saving sinners, belief in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, we all can quote this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This not of your doing, it is the work of God, the gift of God. Not of work so that no one can boast. And Romans 10 says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So faith, we see, is a gift, 
And it comes through one means, hearing the word of Christ. God does impart salvation, but we are responsible to preach the gospel through which salvation comes. We're so quick to affirm the implications of sola scriptura, but our evangelism is void of its power. John Calvin writes that many shamelessly misinterpret the doctrine of election as if it overthrows all exhortations to godly living. He says, Christ commands us to believe in him. Yet when he says, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by my father, his statement is neither false nor contrary to his command. Let preaching then take its course that it may lead men to faith and hold them fast in perseverance with continuing profit. And yet let not the knowledge of predestination be hindered in order that those who obey may not be proud as of something of their own but may glory in the Lord. So God commands us to warn the wicked to turn from their evil ways, and his sovereignty over salvation should not give us an excuse not to speak, but it should prompt us to fulfill his command with satisfaction. The watchman is called to be satisfied in fulfilling his duty. Verse 5, he heard the, trump, he heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken, taken warning, he would have escaped with his life. And verse 9. But as for you, if you, if, if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your life. So somehow, in some way, we will be, we will be held accountable for what we have not said. But if we do speak, if we do our duty... We'll be delivered. Our duty is not to save sinners. We do not find satisfaction and results. My goal today is not for you to come in and weep at the front and make some profession. I'm satisfied in faithful proclamation. Knowing that God is accomplishing His will. Isaiah 46, Yahweh says, For I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, My counsel will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. We can have faith in knowing the sovereign God is accomplishing His purpose by His ordained means. We're to have the disposition of Paul in 1 Corinthians. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. We're to be seed gatherers, or seed spreaders. We don't cause the growth, but we glory in seeing God bring forth the growth. And some will respond in repentance and faith, and some will reject the gospel. But we find peace in knowing that all of Christ's sheep will hear his voice and come to him. 2 Corinthians 2 says, For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one an aroma, an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, in the sight of God, we speak Christ. And just as we find peace in God's sovereignty over salvation, the unbeliever, even this morning, may find peace in God's willingness to save. Verse 10. Now as for you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have spoken, saying, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we are rotting away in them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares Lord Yahweh, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die? O house of Israel. So in verse 10, Ezekiel quotes a comment that is circ circulating among the exiles. The people are finally becoming aware and, and feeling the burden of their guilt. 
They realize what they are because of their sin. They're dead men rotting away. And they ask, how then can we live? And this might have been little more than a cry of pain from these exiles. They escape the sword and they find themselves slowly dying in captivity. But Yahweh uses this last remark as an opportunity for response. And he strengthens the force of his response to their question of life with an, uh, with an affirmation of his own. He says, as I live, as sure as Yahweh lives, he does not find pleasure in the death of the wicked. Actually, it's quite the contrary. He finds pleasure in the wicked turning from their way toward him, finding life in his son. Don't get me wrong. If you don't forsake your sin, if you don't turn from your sin, he, he finds more pleasure in glorifying himself by judging you than he does displeasure in your death. He's just. If you don't repent, he will punish you. But his desire is to save you. His plea is a weighty one. And if you're an unbeliever today, you must respond wisely. He asks, Why then will you die when I've offered you life? We can get into his sovereignty, but ultimately it's because you love your sin. Jesus in John chapter 3 he says that's the reason people don't come to him. Because he is light, and his light will expose your darkness. And you want to cling to your darkness. But God says, why will you die? Like Ezekiel, we live amongst a people who are already under God's judgment. I don't know if we have time for this, but turn to Romans 1 with me. And we're going to cover this quickly. Starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible, incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man, and of birds, and four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over, that's judgment, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. For their females exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the males abandoned the natural function of the, fe function of the female and burned in their desire toward one another. Males with males committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to an unfit mind to do those things which are not proper. That's judgment. Having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, violent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the righteous re requirement of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, 
but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. I don't know if you caught on, but I just described America. And like Ezekiel, we are watchmen in what seems like a hopeless situation. God's wrath has been displayed. He's given this nation up to the impurities of their flesh. He's given them up to a debased mind. They said, I want my sin more than I want to honor you. And he said, okay, go ahead. And our job, our duty as watchmen is in the midst of this judgment, We must enlighten and warn the lost with the full gospel of Jesus Christ. The truth that the scriptures say have been suppressed in unrighteousness, we must present it to them. Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are in the law, so that every mouth may be shut, and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes knowledge of sin. The truth that has been suppressed in unrighteousness is the requirements of God. And we must present it to them so they may become convicted of their sin. Exposed to the sinfulness of their sin. The holy requirements of God. And we must present the gospel of Jesus Christ as their only means for salvation. And we must keep the night watch, pleading with God to save a broken people. Let's pray.